Hello and welcome guys. This is our second video in processing childhood training. Um, today we're going to discuss this technique called autobiography. Uh, it's a very effective, very useful technique. However, some disclaimers in the beginning. First of all, as I said in the previous video, if you have any sus suspicion that you have a clinical condition uh, like uh, eating disorder, depression, anxiety, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, personality disorder, basically any disorder, post traumatic stress disorder, then this exercise is not for you. First of all, you need to go get diagnosed and then understand if this treatment is good for you or bad for you. So please make sure that if you have any uh, clinical diagnosis, don't dive into this training about childhood. You can go into training about cognitive skills, about emotional regulation, about behavioral change, but don't go into childhood because it's not that safe if you have a clinical condition. Okay, and for those who are mentally fine, who are stable, who don't have any clinical problems whatsoever, we can begin. Um, today we're gonna do autobiography exercise. It consists of several steps. Step number one uh, is answering questions in writing about your childhood. This is a very important step and uh, maybe it will take you several days because you can write down like general things that come up then in several days you can reread it and add some pieces and bits that you remember then you can reread it again and add something again so it's very important step number one is that you reply the questions about your childhood and write them down in a coherent narrative step number two you um, go and ask other people about your past experiences like um, your family members your parents your caregivers families friends or maybe teachers if you are in contact with them, maybe your childhood friends. So anyone who saw your family and who saw you uh, in the past, because they can have some different perspective, they can have some different memories, they might remember things that you forgot. Um, so it's very, very important to go and ask them and to gather all this information from different sources. You can also ask your parents, your grandparents about their... Um, own childhood and personal history well I will give you questions for that and once you have gathered all this information once you gather all this information you can proceed to writing a coherent proper autobiography it should be like a story with where you were born what it was like and blah 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 then you're going to read this autobiography to as many listeners as you can. Uh, for example, you can read it to your best friend, you can read it to your dog, you can read it to a flower outside. Most best, of course, to read it to people. But if you don't have so many people whom you trust, you can just read it to yourself, you can read it to your friend, or you can read it to a photo of someone, okay, to your friend who's far away, let's say. The most important thing is that you read it and read it and read it. So this is the plan. And once you do it, you gonna achieve several things. First of all, you will have a clear understanding of your past and maybe see connections of how it's influencing your present. And it can give a lot of meaning to your present, maybe struggles because you understand where they're coming from. Uh, this was first point. Second point is that you can also own up to good things in your past because oftentimes if we had some trauma or if we had some kind of hurt from our past or some kind of pain we close our eyes totally on our past and together with this trauma we do not see our strength our resources we are not in contact with our this like vulnerable self and so on and so on so going through this can get you better in contact with your strengths as well and also so this is number two number three it will give you a coherent story a coherent narrative of who you are where you're coming from what was your life story and so on and so on of course you can st you can change your coherent <laughs> narrative and your story and uh, change your future 
but it's nice to have this solid foundation, solid uh, base on which you rely uh, in your personal journey <laughs> through life. Um, so yes, and maybe it will help improve relationships in your family as well. And especially important if you have children and you don't want to pass down your generational trauma onto them, it's really important to be mindful of what was happening in your own past, in your parents' life, in your grandparents' life, and so on. So, um, questions that you need to reply. I will post them in the comments down below. You can download them or you can make a screenshot and you write them down and reply to each of them. I will exp uh, explain just several important things. First of all, we're talking about your infancy from zero to one years old. This, of course, you don't remember. This, of course, you ask other people what your life was like. But it's really important to still ask them because this period of life, even if we don't remember it, it's really, really important for brain development. So good to know, good to know what, what it was like on the outside. Uh, then early childhood, from one years old to five years old. Um, here many people <laughs> get a bit paranoid if they understand that they don't remember anything. And there is this uh, myth that if you don't remember your childhood, then probably it was very traumatic and it was very horrible. But in reality, it's not like that. Our brain is not designed to remember our early childhood. And it's okay if you do not remember your childhood. It doesn't mean that you had some huge trauma and so on. On the contrary, um, well, it's my personal like experience and opinion is that if you had some trauma in childhood, mostly you're going to remember it. In my experience, it's the opposite. But anyway, it's not proven at all that if you don't have memory of your past, then it's traumatic and so on. Um, then, later childhood, from 5 to 11. Uh, here it's also very important to ask yourself the questions. And here we have questions not only about your family, but also questions about your school, about your relationship with, relationships with friends, about uh, what else. And also very important about emotions. Um, there are several separate questions about how your parents, your caregivers reacted when you showed different emotions. This is extremely, extremely important because um, in some families, children are not allowed to feel some feelings and to express them. In some families, parents themselves cannot control and express their own feelings. Uh, what I mean, for example, how is it supposed to be like in your childhood when you experience feelings? For example, you feel angry and you make a tantrum, <laughs> okay? What your parents do, they tell you, okay, you feel angry, this is normal. I also feel angry sometimes, but let's not shout so loudly. Let's instead, uh, I don't know, beat a pillow, okay? So this way, um, they teach you how to deal with it. Wrong reaction to emotion is when your parent is shaming you, when your parent is making you feel... Uh, like horrible, bad about yourself, when they are making you feel guilty um, and so on and so on for your feelings for and how you express them. Because we as children, we do not know how to express feelings. We just, it's, it's like learning to swim and someone is shouting at you that you swim in the wrong way, <laughs> okay, without telling you how to do it properly. Um, this is one thing. Second thing is that some emotions are forbidden in some families. Like, let's say if you had depressive mother, you're going to be kind of forbidden to express joy in this family. Or let's say you have mother who's overly optimistic and always like, you know, looking at the bright side of things. Then you might not be allowed to express sadness in this family and so on. It's very important to notice which emotions you were not allowed to express freely. Mm, then also, it's important to notice how your parents dealt with their own emotions because our parents especially in childhood they look to us as if they are gods or something they're very very powerful in our vision and if we see them not being able to deal with their own emotions emotions can become mm, really scary for us and 
we can associate them with something very harmful. So it's important to understand like what kind of opinions of emotions we're going to have because of our childhood experience. And this goes both to early childhood and middle childhood and teenage years, all very important. Next also, um, about early childhood, there will be several questions about how you were punished or how you were spoiled. And this is very interesting because um, emotional incest oftentimes comes in different forms. And one form is being this kind of golden child who is like a favorite for the parents or for one of the parents. And when the parent is spoiling the child, and it might seem like the child is like having time of his life and is just very happy but in reality um, it's also very harmful for this child very harmful doesn't let them develop in the right way for them doesn't let them understand boundaries doesn't let them form like normal connections with others and so on and so on and so on so pay attention not to just if you were mal maltreated but also when you were spoiled, when you were a favorite, when you were unfairly kind of put on the high place in your family. This is also very important. Especially, by the way, children who are spoiled like this, they can have some kind of narcissistic traits because they learn this kind of model that they are like on the top in the family. And this can be really harmful for them as well, because in real world, they are not always on top. Okay, uh, then also it's very important um, how other people reacted to how you were treated in the family. And also, um, there are several questions about physical violence and sexual violence. And again, I want to, expl uh, to remind you that in emotional incest cases, there is sexual violence that is like open, for example, a parent is showing you pornography or touching you in their own ways and all that. Um, but there is also covered sexual, sexu sexualized incest. This is when your, your parent is like making funny jokes with sexual context. Or uh, they are treating you as if you are their partner, girlfriend, boyfriend. Or they are telling you about their sex life without you asking for it. So, you know, it's more cover uh, covered, it's more like hidden, but this is also like sexualized uh, violence, but just hidden. Okay, um, also it's really important to, uh, there are several questions about physical touch. It's very, very important because physical touch is necessary. We love physical touch, we need to be hugged, we need to be caressed, we need to be to be in contact with our family physically. Uh, but also sometimes physical touch becomes a way of abuse or of um, kind of uh, going against your boundaries. Like for example, you do not want to be touched, but your mother constantly touches you. And this just makes you mad, okay? Or you don't want to eat, but somebody is constantly feeding you and this just ruins your boundaries and such bodily boundaries they are very like they are like first they are like the most essential the most basic fundamental boundaries that we have and if somebody was touching us hugging us when we didn't want it if somebody was feeding us when we didn't want it all these can also be not good on our relationship with other people and on our attachment and all that so it's really important that touch should also be considered both from good side and from bad side okay and then um, we will discuss your teenage years also very important this is from 11 until 20 years old and here what is important is how did your family react to you growing up? Because in sexualized incest, uh, I mean, in emotional incest in general, and emotional incest is so, so common that basically it's almost like all families, to be honest, at least to some small extent. Uh, so in emotional incest, um, oftentimes there is this connection that either you're forced to grow up too fast or you're forced to remain a child. 
because parent is dependent on you, you are meeting their emotional needs and they want you to continue to be like their small child and they don't want you to grow up. It's very, very important to analyze what kind of messages your parents gave you about growing up. Also about having romantic relationships, about having other friends, about um, moving out of the house, moving away from them and so on. Sometimes these messages are not conscious, they are kind of hidden, like a um, parent doesn't tell you that they don't want you to grow up. On the surface they might be, but in reality by their actions they kind of stopping you every time, they making you feel guilty, they making you feel anxious and so on and so on and so on. Uh, also very important, how do your parents react or caregivers for this matter, people in your family, react when you were um, going through puberty and gaining like more like sexual appeal and how did they react when you maybe started dating someone and so on. All this very important as well because oftentimes, especially in uh, this romanticized emotional incest, sexualized emotional incest, uh, parents treat you like their partner and they become jealous. It, it sounds ridiculous, but that's that's how it, it often happens. Um, okay, this we discussed. And then the next uh, group of question is your young age, your youth from 21 until 30. Uh, where you describe especially important your romantic relationships because they kind of go in the same attachment system as your closest family and they often reflect some problems that you had in childhood. Um, then also children if you have any and after that um, your present day. After you describe all of this in your autobiography you go and ask questions to others in your family, to other people who were like witnesses <laughs> for your growing up. Uh, first of all, you can ask questions to your parents. It's also very interesting. It will be all in the list below, but it was, it's also very interesting. How was their own relationship with their parents? How was their relationship between themselves um, when they had you? Uh, what was the best parts of their marriage or relationship, worst parts and so on? Because oftentimes what we can see in practice is that this whole emotional incest and in general like trauma is kind of transgenerational. It goes from one generation to another until someone stops this cycle. And with these exercises you can stop it finally. And then you can also ask your um, other more distant family members, grandparents, cousins, um, you can also ask your childhood friends family, friends, and so on, and maybe neighbors, ask them what they felt like coming to your house, and so on and so on. And then you write all this down in a coherent narrative, narrative of your life, your autobiography, and then read it again and again and again, preferably to other people, and to kind of let it sink in your brain and let your brain process it. And this is it. This is the autobiography exercise. You will find the full list of questions down below. Please share this video with your friends and family and anyone who might like it. Bye-bye. <laughs>